Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome. Thank you for attending today's Atticus Advantage webinar, the 10 key mistakes attorneys make in selling their practices. My name is Mike Wells with Atticus, and I'll be the organizer on today's broadcast. A few logistics before we begin. Atticus, if you're not familiar with us, was founded in 1989 to provide in-depth, ongoing support and accountability programs for attorneys and law firms that effectively help you increase your gross revenues and personal income, reduce the stress and the number of hours you spend in your office, develop a greater sense of career satisfaction, and most importantly, allow more time for your family and personal interests. Our programs, workshops, and webinars are designed to streamline the management of your practice, increase your revenue, reduce stress, and balance your professional and personal life. If you have a question during today's broadcast, you can do that in two ways. You can use the chat function on your GoToWebinar dashboard to send a message to the event organizer, that's me. If you'd like your question to remain anonymous, please indicate so in your message. You can also click the hand icon to indicate you have a question or comment, and we'll call on you at the end of the broadcast for our question and answer session. When we do, we'll unmute you so that you can be heard by the group. Today's presentation is given to us by Steve Riley, an attorney and practice advisor. Steve helps you with your practice and has a way of, it, of helping you get unstuck and guiding you through a process of self-discovery and major breakthroughs. He's a shareholder in Atticus and a practice which is the largest practice management company working with small and solo attorneys in the country. He created the Practice Growth Program, the, double, the Dominate Your Market Program, and the Double Your Revenue Workshop. And prior to joining Atticus, Steve had built and sold his own law firm. Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to you, Steve. Thank you so much for leading today's presentation. This is a really interesting one, and I think the attendees will get a lot out of it. Thanks, Mike, and uh, good morning or good afternoon or hello to everyone that's attending today's uh, webinar. Um, this webinar is really pulled out of a workshop that we've created to help lawyers think through how to build a law firm for sale. So these are the 10 mistakes that we usually talk about in this workshop. Um, and there were a couple of lawyers, Bob and Greg, and a group of lawyers out of Jacksonville, Florida, that were requesting this particular presentation. They were studying and examining succession planning. So I just want to do a quick hello and shout out to them and say thanks for the support and request. Um, this workshop, like I said, is taught typically uh, in November. I'm leading this year's workshop. And these are the 10 mistakes that we focus on in the workshop towards the end of the workshop. So I'm trying to set up the context. So there's some things here that might be a little out of context that I'll try and fill in as we walk through today's conversation. But uh, I think that this, these 10 mistakes, we can highlight a lot of work and have you think if you're a solo, a small firm attorney and you're thinking about growing your practice, these are probably the 10 common mistakes that I see over and over and over. So my intention um, is twofold. One is to help you create a framework or mindset to think about the future of your law firm. And two is obviously to walk through the 10 key mistakes. Now, just to give you some perspective around this, um, I have personally built and sold a practice. Um, I'm coming up on my 30th year of being an attorney. I've worked with quite a few clients in selling their practices. I'm working with two right now actively in coming up with a succession plan. Um, I've helped negotiate uh, mergers of practices where we merge a couple of different practices together. And of course, I teach succession planning and the exit strategies uh, for our, in all of our group workshops. So I, I know a lot about this particular topic. And as a young lawyer, probably did a hundred post mortem litigation cases involving business transactions where um, people, you know, sold a business or got into business together and sued each other. So I've got a lot of interesting experience with this. I have one CPA that basically told me that he and I did 100 business dissolution deals together where two partners got together and decided to split their partnership. So I've got a lot of unique perspective on this, both from advising, doing it myself, and having, you know, a lot of battle scars. Uh, so you know, to all the litigators out there, I'm, I, I, I have nothing but love and compassion for you guys. I've done a lot of litigation in my life, and it's a, a really, really difficult way of making a living sometimes. Now, with that being said, here's my disclaimer. Um, we're not, Atticus is not a financial planning firm, accounting firm, or law firm. 
we're at the end of the day a consulting firm and we work and advise lawyers on everything from cradle to grave issues, everything from um, how to start and niche your practice, what are the growth areas in law, how to find and hire talented people, how to create compensation systems, how to make more money, how to take more time off, um, how to hire the right CRM or case management system for your firm, how to set your practice up for selling it. At the end of the day, we're really consultants and we work with some really high-end law firms. When I say high-end, I mean solo practitioners that may have a couple hundred employees or quite a few of those, believe it or not, you know, sole owners, to small firms that a guy can't find a job so he sets up his law firm, um, you know, out of the towel. So we have a lot of experience and perspective. But at the end of the day, we're not financial planners, lawyers, or we're while we do have a lot of lawyers on our team, um, we're not practicing law and we're not doing accounting. Um, and two, this workshop is not designed to provide you an appraisal of your practice. Uh, you need to do proper due diligence. I am going to talk toward the end of today's call about five common valuation methods that I use in talking to lawyers that are getting ready to sell their practice. So I'll walk through those and kind of have you think about that and you can value your firm a little bit, and I'll talk about um, the eight value drivers I think that buyers look in buying firms, which I think is critical if you're going to go sell your firm, what, what are buyers looking at? Um, I will use three terms on this webinar that I wanna make sure we're clear about. So these are three distinct terms. Exit in the context of this webinar or workshop will mean your final departure from the firm. What is your exit when you open the door and walk out, and that's your exit. Two is transition. Transition refers to the point in time where you, the exiting lawyer, shifts primary responsibility successors, and you personally start winding down your activities inside the firm. That doesn't mean you may be winding down your life, maybe you may be doing something else. I mean, I will tell you that when I sold my practice, um, there was an interesting period of time there that uh, I was, questioning what would be next for me and ended up going here which has been a really really rewarding and uh, intriguing shift in my career sale is the actual transfer of ownership to an outside buyer it could be an associate but it could also be a third-party buyer i've advised a lot of lawyers that sold out to third-party buyers i didn't sell to an associate i sold to a third-party buyer so there's a lot of opportunities out there to sell um, your firm to you know other lawyers, so especially younger lawyers. So there's these are these are um, three critical terms. So when I walk through this, sometimes uh, I see people use them interchangeably. I'm going to try not to do that. I'm going to try to say exit means you're walking out the door and you're done. Transition means you've sold the practice or you've sold majority shares of the practice, and you have a transition phase. My transition phase was about six months to a year when I sold my practice. And sale is then the point in time you actually have given up equity or given up control of your practice. So those are three terms that we'll use. Now, as we do this, um, as we do this, I just would be remiss if I didn't hit uh, four elements of thinking around growing your practice. Most lawyers believe that when they go to grow their practice, the thing that matters and the only thing that matters is their legal skills. And my experience is that after five to 10 years of practicing law, you're about as good as you're going to get. Um, everything else after five to 10 years is improvements on nuances, maybe tweaking a few skills here and there. But it really doesn't make a significant difference to your growth or net. If you can draft a better complaint, do a better deposition, argue a better motion, typically it's not going to improve your growth or net, nor will it improve the amount of new leads you get as a lawyer. You know, your client may be happy, you may be happy, you may have feel like you served your client well by doing a really great job. But the mindset that I call a great lawyer mindset is a blinded mindset, is an academic mindset, and one in which you think the only way you can get ahead is becoming a greater and a greater lawyer. And the only thing that does is burn you out and um, ultimately um, see your income get squeezed and, and diminished over a period of time because the real core four skills to actually grow a practice are first and foremost your time management skills. So if you're trying to take a practice from a million dollars in gross revenue as a solo practitioner or half a million dollars, in, you know, depending on where you're at in your practice, and you're trying to go to two and a half million, um, your time management skills will have to shift. Your ability to manage other people will have to shift. 
your ability to focus will have to shift. And most of the time when a lawyer is going to increase growth and improve net, it's not their legal skills we need to work on. First and foremost, we have to work on your time management skills. So when we go through the mistakes, you'll see time management being one of the fundamental mistakes and decision, I should say decision, but focus management in when you decide to set your firm up for sales, a pretty crucial component. Two, client development and marketing. If you have a relationship founder dependent law firm, it's going to be less value to a buyer versus a firm that has an automated marketing process. There are some really remarkable law firms that their marketing is incredible. And there's other law firms that have inconsistent cash flow because the owner of the firm, the lawyer, does inconsistent marketing. When they don't have any cash, they go market. And then they build up their workflow, they have too much work to do, so they quit marketing. And then they have these ebbs and flows and cash, uh, you know, they have cash flow crisis, market gets some work in the door, cash flow crisis, market gets some work in the door. And they have this really horrible yin and yang, actually yin and yang, but yo-yo-like experience around cash flow. It's because they're inconsistent in their marketing. You know, they're doing in their marketing, they're inconsistent, their marketing skills are very, very poor. Building a great team. This is the blind spot for a lot of us as lawyers. Honestly, it's probably was the biggest blind spot for me. If you're trying to get out of a solo practitioner where, where you have three staff or six staff, that's typically what I see most solo grow to. Um, it's because they, most lawyers can't get beyond about six support staff because you have this concept called span of management. The problem with span of management is that as a good attorney, you only can manage about three to six people, then you either lose your mind or you know, run out of time. To actually expand the firm, one of the biggest things that you have to do is shift your management structure. You start to shift them at a team leader, not an office manager, but a distinct team leader. Um, you start to shift to profit centers inside the firm, and you start to restructure the management and profit zones inside the firm. And to do that, you go, I see lawyers go through phases. They go through um, people that are decent. They go through people that are good. They go through people that are great. And it takes a while to learn, you know, how, how to hire, manage, and work with people to build a firm that is consistent with your values, consistent with the culture you want, and consistent with serving clients in the way that you want. So as you listen to this webinar, um, you know, you're going to hear some distinctions around teams. And then last but not least is cash flow and profitability. If you have a marginally profitable firm and you're not doing well financially, um, it is going to impact the value of your firm from a buyer's perspective. So when I, you hear me push lawyers to improve their cash flow, improve their profitability, it's really because if you're going to sell the firm, we want to be selling a firm that first and foremost is a profitable firm. So we'll deal with some of these issues more, but as we look at these, if you're looking to grow your firm, these are typically the four absolute cornerstones for growth. Improving time management, improving client development and marketing skills, building a great team, which is your management and hiring skills, and cash flow and profitability. These are distinct conscious skill building tools. No different than drafting a motion, no different than trying a case, no different than drafting a trot. These are no different. These are just different skills. And if you have a mindset that the only way you can grow a practice is by being a greater lawyer, um, you're going to miss that these are actually the four cornerstone skills to growth. The lawyers that master these skills crush, totally crush the other lawyers that are head down, looking at their desk, just trying to draft better um, because they're looking at the wrong issue. You know, they're really coming from an academic mindset. So with that being said, I just want to lay the groundwork and the context before I start walking through some of the mistakes. So good. So here's mistake number one, <clears throat> waiting till you feel ready. Look, if you're gonna sell your practice, you may need to start planning how to do it today. Um, and it may not because you're thinking, well, I am 45, my goal is sell it when I'm 70. Uh, life doesn't work that way. Um, in my case, I sold my practice. I was ready to sell my practice in my early 40s. Um, I sold it when I was, I got to get my math right, 47. And the reason I sold it when I was 47 uh, was my mother developed Alzheimer's. And for my wife and I, it was a really important choice that we actually decided to move to support my parents. 
but uh, the practice was lucrative. I was very happy with the practice and was very um, blessed and grateful that I found a really great lawyer to sell it to. And it was really a time in my life where it gave me freedom to do something I want to do, which was be with a loved one. Now, we've had lawyers that have had really terrible things, like where they've gotten leukemia and have to have bone marrow transplants, and they were out of their practice for a year. If you're going to build a practice, you want to think about how do you build a practice that's not dependent on you. And I know it's easier said than done, um, but this, you know, we see, we see it done all the time. It's easier said than done on a quick webinar like this. But I'm really trying to get you to think about it from the perspective that, you know, you may not have the time that you think you have. Um, something may just happen outside your firm that leaves you with no other choice but to sell the firm. And in this case, I had a choice. Um, I had a choice between moving my mom and dad closer to us and my father um, really wanted to keep my mom in the home that they'd lived in for you know the past 40 years because she knew it and knew it well. And I think in hindsight, it was easier for us to go to the mountain than to have the mountain come to us. Um, but making sure, waiting until you feel ready, if it is um, a trap, because a lot of lawyers will say, well, when I'm ready, I'll start to work on it. Nope, you need to work on it now. You need to start thinking about what do I have to do now to get my firm ready for sale, because it ultimately will drive profits and make it more valuable. Now, when you do this, um, I want you to think about your calendar, and I want you to think about your week. If your calendar looks like this jelly bean jar, where it's overflowing and overstuffed, you've got a time management problem. And if you've got a time management problem like this, where you're taking on four cases, you're not managing well, you're not managing cases well, um, you're not selecting clients well, you're not managing staff well, your calendar is going to look like this. And one of the ways that you can do, or one of the ways you can think about this, is also to look at your office right now. If you're using your office as a to-do list, if you're using your desk and your Outlook inbox, assuming you're using Outlook, as a to-do list, you're not managing your firm well, and you're really kind of out of control. It's one of the things I like to do is I like the lawyers to send me pictures of their offices. It's one of the things we have them work on the first 90 days to six months in the group program, the practice growth program. We have them work on cleaning their office. It's called the clean office solution. Because the office becomes a dashboard for what's not working in the firm. You know, if you think about it, if you walked into a cardiologist's office and say, hey, look, I'm having heart pain. Um, you walk into an office where there's a surgical desk with blood on the desk and, you know, bloody instruments and Band-Aids on the floor. Um, no, you walk into a pristine spot. And that's typically how most lawyers' offices look to clients. It looks like a, a mess. It looks like a mess. And it's usually a reflection that the firm's out of control. So the reason I'm saying this is that if you're trying to build a practice for sale, one of the first things that you need to do is get control of your firm and get control of your time so that you have excess capacity in your day so you can work on some of the projects that will actually make your practice more valuable. If you're living a Groundhog Day life experience, like the movie, Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day, um, you're just going to be like running on the treadmill for 5 to 10 to 15 years, and you're not going to make any improvement that will actually make your firm more valuable. So the first thing I'm going to recommend is not waiting until you get ready. I would say start now, and start now by getting control of your firm and getting control of your time so that you have capacity in your firm and capacity in your day. Now, by what I mean by this is not going out and taking everything on your desk and dumping it on your legal assistant or your paralegal or your associate, because all you're going to do is have a, a backup. It's going to be like clogging the plumbing. It's just going to flow right back to your desk. You have to do this firm-wide. You have to go through and think systemically, how do I get it so everybody in the firm has a little excess capacity in breathing room so we're not redlining the firm all the time? If you're redlining your firm and your firm and you feel like your firm looks like this jelly bean jar where it's overflowing with projects, cases, and stuff, um, you're going to have a very difficult time building a law firm for sale because you have no time to do it. Mistake number two, not having your estate planning and law firm dissolution plan in place in case of death and disability. Your lawyers, everybody on this call is a lawyer. 
We might have a business broker looking out there. That's totally fine. But everybody on this phone is a lawyer. You have no excuse whatsoever for not having an estate plan in place. I'm going to strongly recommend that if you're not an estate planning attorney, you call your friend who's an estate planning attorney or you call a friend who knows an estate planning attorney and go get your estate plan done in the next 30 days, get a revocable living trust done so that you can control the privacy and the dissolution or the privacy in the cell of your practice so it's not controlled by a judge and not controlled by the probate process in your local jurisdiction. Because any of you that have done probate, like I've had to go through in Hillsborough and Pinellas County when I was practicing, um, yeah, you don't want the judge approving the sale or not approving the sale. You don't want the judge telling you how to run a deceased lawyer's law practice. It's not a good thing. You want to make sure control is in the hands of the people that you want it in control of. So you want to go meet with a lawyer. I don't care if your practice is doing 300 grand or 3 million. I want you to go get this done. And I'm just going to be out there on a limb. I don't know all of you, but I'm just going to say it's irresponsible for you if you don't have an estate plan, estate plan in place and a simple one-page to two-page law firm dissolution plan in place in case of death or disability. Because all you're going to do if you don't have this is you're going to foist a giant mess. And I, I'm saying this from seeing it done over and over by lawyers. You're just going to drop a giant mess on someone else's lap that doesn't deserve to come in and clean up your mess. So be responsible, you know, be responsible. Clean it up now, put together an estate plan, put together, my position is take an RLT, revocable living trust, talk to a good estate planning attorney. If you don't know one, pop me an email. I know thousands of estate planning lawyers across the country. Pop me an email, I can give you a recommendation during wherever your jurisdiction's at. Enough of the lecture, but I'm serious. Ladies, gentlemen, you need to do this. If you don't have one in place, I want one in place in the next 30 days. If you don't have one that's been updated in the past one to two years, go update it. If you did one 10 years ago, I sincerely doubt it's workable now. Um, mistake number three, not putting together a financial plan outside of your firm. Your firm has some value in a walk through the value of the firm towards the end of our time together today and how to value them. But I'm going to strongly recommend one of the most important things you can do, despite whatever your age is, um, is to go find a great financial planner and set up a retirement plan and a life insurance plan for your family outside your law firm. It's the responsible thing to do. I would be looking at how do you save money as a practicing attorney. I would be tithing to yourself 10, 20 percent, whatever you can put aside, um, not only just in your retirement plan, but in your and whatever stock portfolio or real estate investments that you want to do, but you have to be responsible. This is a long-term game. You're not going to be able to sell your law firm for millions and live off of it. It doesn't work that way. I've seen very few law firms trade for that kind of money. So you have to be responsible now to start saving money and investing well for the long term. That's mistake number three. I have lawyers that have for 20 years not put any money in a retirement plan and have done a poor job investing for the long term. They call us and say, yeah, I need I need to make 300 grand a year off my retirement benefits. Um, can I sell my law firm for $30 million? No, you can't. As a solo practitioner doing 300 grand, it's not worth that. So you have to be responsible now to start putting money aside. Mistake number four. This one is a take it to the bank. I have seen this a hundred times. I'm sitting here with my head in my hand, shaking my head because I've seen this over and over and over and over. Okay, this is mistake number four. If you have an associate attorney or a young attorney that you're looking to be a successor, they are the very last person that you wanna to complain to about running a law firm and how hard it is and how little money you make. You don't have a backstage, you only have a front stage to this person. What I mean by that is you cannot emotionally vomit or throw up on this person and complain about what you don't like about running your practice. All you're doing is poisoning the well against your potential future successor. Now, I know they may be thinking, or you're thinking, all, all they're doing is venting. No, what you're doing is ruining it. I got offered partnership when I was a young lawyer 
at a law firm. And I honestly didn't want to work there because all the bad things the partner said about running the firm. He complained about when they were, you know, uh, not making payroll. He complained when there's inconsistent cash flow. He complained about clients. Um, and then he and his partners got together and offered me an equity stake in the firm. And I was like, what are you, crazy? You think I want to work here? All you guys do is talk about how terrible it is. Why would I ever want to work here? Um, and they work like dogs, you know. Why would I ever want that type of a life as a young lawyer? And if you add on what the millennial mindset is like now, having a complaint about how terrible it is to work hard as a lawyer and how little money you make is guaranteeing that the associate attorney that you're talking to today will not be your associate attorney that you sell the practice to. You have to think about who are you complaining to. If you're complaining to your future buyer, you're complaining to an attorney that you're thinking in a few years you're going to sell the firm to, all you're doing is persuading them not to buy the firm. I, I wish I had a hundred bucks every time I saw somebody do this, I could buy one of those fancy Teslas. It is just crazy, crazy, crazy. It's one of the most chronic and stupid mistakes I see us make as lawyers. Don't complain to your associates about how bad it is to run a firm. Because if you're going to sell them a firm, what you want to be able to do is really be bragging to them how great it is, how wonderful it will be when they're a partner, and when they buy the firm from you, how much they'll love it. So if you're going to complain about it, it's just not going to work. Um, you're just going to ruin the greatest buyer that you potentially have and persuade them not doing, you're not doing a deal. Mistake number five. It's kind of a playoff of mistake number four, but there's a lot of times when I'm talking to an attorney who's um, you know, up there and looking to sell the practice and has a very good associate attorney. And the associate might be with the firm five to 10 years. And when I say, are you ready to start talking partnership to them or talking about what your succession plan is, the lawyer says, no, the senior lawyer says, no, I'm not ready because I don't think my associate's ready. If they've been there for five to 10 years and they're not ready, whose fault is it? If they're not ready after a five to 10 year career with you, whose fault is it? What's missing? Most of the time is not that they're not ready, it's that you're not ready. You're not emotionally ready. You're not emotionally committed to the process. You haven't thought it through. Some of the practice advisors that are on our team that work with lawyers and selling their practices tell this, this is one of the biggest problems they have, is that the lawyer says, I don't think my associate's ready. Well, if they're not ready, when will they be ready? And what will ready look like to you? And so you got to think about it. If you've got an associate right now that you're thinking about selling the firm to, um, what does ready look like? Because most of these associates will leave about 20% when, when they're about 80% ready. And there's 20%, that final 20%, you're waiting for them to get to be 100% ready. When they're about 80%, they'll realize that you're not really emotionally ready to sell the firm. And they'll leave. And they'll set up their own practice. Um, and then you'll be furious because you wasted five to 10 years on this relationship and now they become a competitor. Well, most of the time it's because you haven't really talked to them, you haven't thought through your process, you haven't thought through your plan, and you haven't given a roadmap to follow. I've talked to so many associates that said, well, you know, I waited for 10 years at the firm. He kept saying that, hey, one day this will be yours. And I realized he's not going anywhere. He's going to die to death. This guy is going to die to death. And there's no way in the world that I'm going to be a partner here. And he's not going to, he's not going to make me a partner. He's not going to give me 10% ownership because he keeps saying I'm not ready. No, the truth is he's not ready. So when you're looking at this, um, you've got to get great clarity. When is your associate ready? When is your associate going to be at a point that they're at least 80% ready before you enter into a written agree with, agreement? Now, in the written agreement about succession and becoming a partner, you can have stages. You can have conditions of satisfaction they have to show. Um, one of the big things that I always look for in a young associate of success is their ability to rain make. They may bring in business. They may be technically proficient, but if you, know, you end up taking a note back, which you more than likely will when you sell your practice, if they can't generate business, um, I don't care how well of a you know, I don't care how well they draft. I don't care how great they are in front of a judge or a jury. If they can't generate business, they can't carry the debt. So, you know, if you're looking at when is your associate ready, you may have a different criteria for a successor associate than maybe a service partner. So this is a big one. This is a big one. I, you know, and I'm taking total advantage of the fact that um, 
we're brothers and sisters at the bar and I'm talking to you straight here and just telling you this is the way it works from my, my viewpoint. I'm not sugarcoating anything, but I, unfortunately that's kind of my reputation in the marketplace. I don't sugarcoat. Um, you got to think about this. Uh, mistake number six, this one's a little different. And I usually recommend that if you're starting to set up your firm for sale, that you build a client advisory board. Now in my practice, before I sold, I probably used client advisory boards for a oh, good five to 10 years. And my client advisory board would be giving everything, feedback on everything from pricing to marketing to what have you. But I really used them because most of my clients were very smart, sophisticated people. And they were able to give me feedback on what my potential buyer and successor looked like. Everything from reputation to community to just straight up meeting them. So um, why is it important to form a client advisory board to vet and develop a relationship and rapport with your successor? Well, think about it. These are the people that you're ultimately trying to persuade um, your successor to do business with, and quite frankly, you're trying to persuade them to do business with your successor. So they're not going to naturally jump on board and say, hey, um, because you sold the practice, we will continue to work with this lawyer. It doesn't work that way. They've got to have a feeling for this lawyer. So they've got to have a feeling for your successor. They've got to have a confidence in your successor. So a client advisory board can be a critical critical element, especially if you're in a transactional practice, like real estate, um, you know, estate planning practice, elder law practice, um, some types of commercial litigation practice, corporate practices in particular. Um, so uh, there's a lot of practices out there where you have stable client base, and that stable client base being able to hand that over becomes a key element for success in selling the practice. Mistake number seven. This is a good one. I've had this happen probably three or four times. Um, it's happening right now for a very dear friend who's been practicing for about 30 years. Uh, he found out that his right-hand person has announced their retirement and actually beat them to the punch. This key team member, which is a critical element to the value of the firm, has decided that they're going to retire in the next year, which actually puts a hole in the value of the firm. So I've seen this happen where key team members who are within the same age range of the lawyer or sometimes older than a lawyer um, or their spouses retire sooner than you anticipated or planned. And they were part of the package that you were trying to sell to another lawyer. And if they retire or, decide, or their spouse retires, um, it starts to start a countdown for their participation in your firm. So one of the things you have to think about is if you're going to sell your firm, um, will these people be there? Will they continue to be there? What's the age range of your team that you're kind of bundling in in the sale of your firm? Uh, number eight, mistake number eight. Um, not getting your team's buy-in to support the transition and enrolling key team members in employment agreements. So uh, when I went to sell my firm, I had a handful of key people. They were dis I discussed the process with them. I they were actually the ones that one of them and my great paralegal suggested who the buyer should be. But when you're looking at this, you want to think through, wow, one of the most valuable things for a buyer is my team. I've got to make sure that they're on board for the transition. Some of them, I may have to have employment agreements. Um, as a non-lawyer, they can sign covenants not to compete. They can sign non-solicitation as it relates to other key team members. Um, so you can tighten that up should you choose to do that. Obviously, there's some issues getting a lawyer to sign on compete, and uh, we know that you can't do that ethically, at least in the state of Florida. Um, but there's other jurisdictions that do allow key um, non-competes on certain situations involving transition and sell. So it's just something to look at. We won't spend much time today on that because that was something we'd have to spend more time on in the workshop. Um, okay, great. So that was mistake number eight. Mistake number nine, uh, not paying attention to your profitability or the lack thereof. Well, let's talk about this for a few minutes because 
really, if you're trying to buy a law firm as a buyer, do you want a marginally profitable law firm or a lucrative law firm? Well, if you're selling a firm that's marginally profitable and you're selling it to a third party or a successor and they're taking a note back to carry the debt service and pay your note plus make a living off the practice, there needs to be some margin there. So if you sold a practice and your profit margin, let's just say for fun, it's $15,000 a month and there's a $5,000 note there, you know, where they've got to make a $5,000 payment a month to you as a, as a seller, um, the buyer does, um, then they're in a position where they have to um, be able to live off the 10 grand that they're currently making. And that may not be a big deal or it may be a very big deal. I'm just using that as an example because if you've got a practice that's making $7,000 a month, and you're trying to sell it where there's a $5,000 note payment, it may not work for the buyer. It may not work for the buyer at all because there's no way that they can make money and live at the same time off the net for what they're, you know, off the net of they're making off the firm. So your profitability is pretty critical. You know, it's absolutely crucial for a buyer to know that you're profitable. And profitable means that, you know, you can make a good living as a salary and benefits plus throw down a decent profit margin. As a rule of thumb, I like to see a lawyer making about a 35% profit margin over and above what would be considered a reasonably good compensation package for their age and skill level. So that means that if you have been doing this for 25 years, you're board certified and um, have some really good legal skills, what would it cost to hire a 25-year lawyer who's board certified to replace you in your firm. That's your reasonable compensation and then a decent profit margin. Now I'm going to avoid the distinctions around the S corp, the C corp, and how people play games. So I'm gonna leave that to you and your, your tax advisors, especially with the new tax law in play, things get very interesting there. But uh, you need to know if you're going to sell the practice, you need to be making some money. You need to be showing that it's profitable, there's some margins there because more than likely you will not be getting all cash up front. You'll more than likely be taking a note back for a considerable portion of the package or a considerable portion of the deal. Um, mistake 10. Now we're gonna spend a few minutes here um, not thinking about it or building it from the buyer's perspective. So as a seller, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, you know, my firm is so amazing. I, I have three really great employees. My computers are killer. This is great. This is great. My clients love me. I have word of mouth business. Um, and I make a really good living. I get to work six days a week. And I get to work so many hours a week during the days. is the best thing ever. Um, a buyer may not see it that way. And so in advising buyers and talking to buyers, I really think that there's different things that buyers look at versus sellers. Um, I've looked at a couple of practices in my career to buy them. When I sold my practice and I moved to where I'm at currently, I looked at a couple of practices to buy, and I really was shocked at how many, what I, how many shag carpet practices that I found. And a shag carpet practice is where you walk in, the lawyer literally has shag carpet from the 70s. They have candy computers that they haven't upgraded. And when the lawyer's looking at selling, they're like, yeah, me, Martha, and Cindy, we're all going to retire and sell the firm at the same time. And oh yeah, I want a million dollars for my $300,000 growth firm. Um, you know, it, it's got no value, man. It's, it's a shag carpet firm, it's, it's worth nothing. And there's a lot of shag carpet firms out there where there's just of no value to the buyer because the seller thinks that they're wonderful, but they really haven't thought about it from the buyer's perspective. So I'm going to walk you through the criteria, the value drivers, but if I'm looking at your law firm and I was valuing your law firm, what I'm going to look for. So number one is profitability. Are you making a living? Are you making good profits? I'm gonna look at your profitability. You know, I'm really going to say, are you making money? Because I need to know you're making money as an advising a buyer. They need to know that they can carry the note and they can make money. So if you're not profitable, you know, there's something that there's something that you've got to work on there. Um, two, is it transferable? Is, do we have transferability or is it founder dependent? Are you the key to everything? Is the firm totally dependent on you? 
And one of the greatest ways that we test this is your ability to take time off. This is one of the reasons in the upper level programs I try and drive lawyers to um, 175 days off a year because if you're taking time off, and when I say 175 days off a year, I mean no email, no phone calls. You build the firm so you can take that much time off because the less you're there, the more valuable the firm becomes. The more time you can take off, the more valuable your firm becomes to a buyer. If you're there all the time and you're the hero of your firm or you come to the rescue of the clients, you come to the rescue of the staff, you're the hero of your firm's story, then the value of your firm is pretty small in comparison to another firm. So it's a very, very founder dependent. It has less value. Um, team. Uh, is your team a constant flow of interruption? Or are they self-managing? You know, if your team is self-managing, there's some value to there. But if they're constantly coming and asking you what to do, it usually means they're untrained, poorly, you know, not really well skilled, and there's a poor management process in place because they, they, they have to interrupt you because they don't know what to do next. Um, managing and leadership. Um, what is your management structure? What's your leadership structure? I really think the key level for most lawyers to growing their firm to multi-million dollar firms is not their legal skills. It's really right here, their ability to manage and lead people, to manage the ability to cast a vision, execute on the vision, inspire other people to live into that vision. Um, they may be good at the law or maybe even great at law, but if they're lacking management leadership skills, it won't matter. They can't grow the firm beyond themselves. But developing management leadership skills is probably one of the most found things that you can do to make your firm valuable because to a buyer, they can step into that management role. So it's pretty important that you think about that just from a systems perspective. How do I, how do I make it so the firm operates this model? Um, which leads us into the next four, systems and process. You know, do you have a personality-driven approach or do you have a systems-driven approach? Is it well, you know, the streamlined, well-developed? Are your systems actually an asset to the firm? Technology, are you well leveraged with, you know, a good CRM, a good back-end assembly program? I mean, today there's so many remarkable case management systems out there. I'm always blown away when I talk to a lawyer and I say, well, how do you manage your cases? He goes, well, I use Dropbox and Outlook. Like, good Lord. Um, yeah, I wouldn't buy that firm, you know, because it shows me that this lawyer has no idea what they're doing in running a firm. Because if I said, let's send an email to all your clients and announce that we've got a workshop or we're doing a, a new event, they would have to go through and organize their Outlook or organize from Dropbox all the client data and then send out this email. That's not, that's not an asset, that's actually a liability. That is a disorganized firm from a management perspective. The, the lawyer doesn't know what they're doing. It may be convenient and easy, but it, and you may be saving some money, but at the end of the day, you're cutting your own throat for the value of the firm. Having a, a CRM, a case management system, or some way that you can manage relationships um, in today's environment, it's so cheap and so easy versus what it was 10 to 15 years ago. It's just ridiculous how cheap it is. So if you don't have a good case management system, get one. Just get one. And there's four or five out there that you can just uh, use for 30 days and see what you like. And you can test drive them. And they're very reasonably priced. And their ability to train people and use it is, is very, very quick and easy. Um, so I get asked all the time, what are my favorites? I'll give you four that I really like, and you can just check them out. Um, Clio is a big player out there. Um, I think Clio is terrific. Uh, Rocket Matter is Rocket Matters is terrific. I think uh, I think the lawyer that I mean the founder of that done some really beautiful, powerful things. Uh, Practice Panther has come on strong in my case. Um, so my case is a terrific one. So those are four case management systems that I think are all cloud-based, fairly easy to use, very reasonably priced. There's some other ones. If you have fans of other ones that you really love, you feel free to email me and I'll check them out. But those are usually the four big ones that I recommend and help people check out. If you're brand new to the business, um, I still recommend that you consider getting one so you start being organized and managing your data and managing the files and paperless and uh, it will save you time and money over the years. So those are, those are the eight value drivers. If you're coming to the workshop, I'd walk you through what I call the value driver scorecard, where we basically have you go through one to 12 scoring this, everything from profitability to where you're at. 
Um, so you might, so profitably score might be I feel confidently stressed about my cash flow. I don't think I'm paid enough to the work I'm doing. Are the more half the upper extreme is more than half my income derived from profit. Um, I'm not going to do that with you today because it's going to take too long and we only have an hour scheduled for this. During the workshop, if you're interested in coming, I usually spend about 90 minutes just on value drivers and having you think this through. Um, so if you're interested in going to the workshop, just by all means hit atticusadvantage.com and we have information about the workshop and I can show you some information next. All right, so I'm trying to go through this amount of material as quickly as possible so I can give you at least a sense of everything to look at. One of the things I promised, and I do this also in the workshop, is there's really, in my eyes, five valuation models. And I don't care what your CPA says, I really don't. You know, I have CPAs that would call me and say, well, I value the firm differently. And I'm like, okay, terrific, why don't you buy it? You know, don't let me stand in your way. Well, they're like, well, I can't buy it. I say, yeah, you can't. You can value it as a CPA from a cost accounting perspective. But I actually done this for three decades of my life, and I know other people have done this, and I know what these things are worth. So don't come calling me and saying, hey, look, I looked up the valuation in some business valuation book and said, I, well, I've calculated it like this, and that's the value. That's great, but that's not what I'm going to recommend the buyer pay. I'm going to recommend the buyer pay probably one of these five valuation models. Um, so one is a cleanup model. A cleanup model is where it's going to cost some money to someone to clean it up. And unfortunately, this is the predominant one that I see most lawyers choose, where they are solo and small firm attorneys, where they have no life insurance, um, and they leave a mess, usually for their spouse, who's an unlicensed lawyer, an unlicensed person, and not a lawyer, um, to clean it up. And they have to pay someone to come in and do it. Or in some jurisdictions like Florida, you have an inventory lawyer, and an inventory lawyer gets stuck doing it. It's usually a good friend of yours who, you know, God bless them, is coming in and cleaning up the mess that you left. Number two is fire sale. And this is the percentage of revenue over time. And typically what I see is a fire sale where a lawyer says, you know, I've gotten sick or I've got this issue. Excuse me. Uh, I got this issue and I need to sell my practice. And uh, they may be appointed to the bench. They may be, you know, got a really cool job offer. Or they may have won the lottery. Who knows? Uh, but most of the time, they've gotten sick, is what I see. And what they end up doing is selling the firm for a percentage of revenue over time. And usually, I see 20% for 12 to 72 months. So that's basically 20% of fees off that client base that's generated. So if the lawyer that buys the practice or takes it over generates $100,000 they pay the lawyer 20%, 20 grand for that work. And it's typically anywhere from 12 to 24 to as much as 72 months. Um, there's some light auditing provisions that some lawyers negotiate in, but most of the time it's really not a lot of money being involved here. Number three, if it's a decent practice, if it's a decent practice where I've got some good team, I'm, I'm impressed with the team. I'm going to typically sell it for half of gross. So if you're doing a million dollars in revenue, it's, and you've been averaging a million dollars in revenue for the past five years, then it's probably worth a half a million dollars. Um, for a great practice. Well, for the great practice, and I've seen very few of these, even up to 20%, it could be one year's revenue. So if I'm using my million dollar example, it could be a million dollars, or it could be a multiple, depending on what the, what, what the drivers might be. And, you know, I've walked through the eight value drivers. It might be a very profitable firm. Their marketing might be on autopilot. Their team might be self-managing. And if that's the case, it looks a lot more valuable to a buyer than a firm where, um, you know, it's a shy carpet firm. So it's totally worth it. And then typically when firms have recurring revenue, and you're seeing this a lot more in estate planning practices, corporate practices, some real estate practices, elder law practices, and some of the family law lawyers are catching on how to do this, which is where there's a recurring revenue stream, not repeat business, but recurring revenue where the client pays monthly, annually, or quarterly for some type of service. Usually those, those firms will trade for a multiple of three um, based on the recurring revenue. So if they have $300,000 a year in recurring revenue, 
I would recommend to the buyer that they pay three times that recurring revenue, so $900,000 for that component. So these are typically the five valuation models I see. I wanna make sure we've got a few minutes for questions. So um, I am going to basically say, look, if you're interested and you wanna get some more information about this workshop, um, go to our website, atticusadvantage.com, um, and you can see this great big arrow, gold arrow, from where it says what we do. Those of you are following along on the screen, click workshops, it'll take you over to um, a screen that tells you, hey, look, I want to register for this workshop. You click the details and registration, and it'll tell you um, how to do it. We're teaching this in Orlando at the Orlando Hyatt at the airport where the bar for the bar does a tremendous amount of conferences. Um, if you're also interested, you will notice that right next to that is our one of our signature workshops, which is called Double Your Revenue, which is a one-day workshop where we talk about how to take your firm's revenue and double them. So typically what we see is that uh, about two thirds of the lawyers that take this workshop will double their firm's revenue. Um, anywhere between the quickest with six to seven months, the average is about 18 to 24 months. So it's usually directly correlated to the first mistake that I shared, which is how much room does a lawyer have in their calendar. And so if you're interested on in doing this, our company founder, uh, Mark, Powers is leading the one in Chicago and Boston. Mark is a fabulous coach and a fabulous instructor. If you can get there to see him, I would take advantage of that. And then I'm leaving, I'm personally leading the one in Orlando um, in November 5th. Great. Now, my suggestion to you is the most important thing out of today's webinar is to take some form of action. I don't want you going back and say, well, I'm going to think about what he said. And I'm going to think about it for the next six months. I'm going to think about it for another nine months. I'm going to think about it for two or three years. I really, really, really can only encourage you to take some action. I don't care if it's one action. Um, the one action I recommend to a lot of you is to get your estate plan in place. If you don't have it done, go get it done. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't had the opportunity to start redoing your time management, it's time to redo your time management. So whatever you need to do, to move your practice closer to being ready for sale. I didn't say sell it, but getting it ready for sale. I'm, I'm going to encourage you to do that out of today's call. Um, and with that, I'm going to thank you, open it up for questions, and just say if you want to get invited to free webinars similar to what we're doing today, just pop us an email at grow at atticusadvantage.com, and we'll add you to our invite list to upcoming webinars uh, whenever we get the opportunity to do a a webinar, we typically do one a month on some topic related to running your firm and making, um, you know, making good decisions about how to run your firm. So if you would like to get added to that email list, just email us at grow at atticusadvantage.com. And with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions that you might have or if there's something I need to clarify. Um, Mike, why don't you um, open it up and see if we've got any questions? Absolutely. Uh, if you have a question, again, there are two ways you can do that. You can use the chat function on your GoToWebinar dashboard to send a message to the event organizer. That's me. If you'd like that question to remain anonymous, uh, please indicate so in your message. You can also click the hand icon to indicate a question or comment, and I'll call on you and I'll unmute you at that time so that you can be heard by the group. We have a couple of questions already sent in. Um, the first one is, with so many days off, uh, you had said 175 a year, a buyer uh, could expect uh, the staff to buy the business or take away key clients. How do you deal with that possibility? That's a great question. Um, my experience is that you're going to work through those issues prior to taking that much time off. So with your team, non-lawyer team, I'm usually going to anchor them around good compensation and good employment agreements. With associate attorneys, typically you want to give them an offer where it's better for them to work for you than open up their own practice. So it requires you as a business owner to actually think strategically about how do you improve your practice in a very important way so that you can have the freedom to take this time off. Um, so our experience has been for the lawyers that are doing it that their team actually steps up and their associates actually step up. And we haven't had, you know, knock on wood, haven't had an issue where somebody quits and takes uh, clients and competes against a lawyer that's taking time off. 
if anything, the associates look upstream and go, my God, I can't wait to be like that. And that's really what you're trying to show them. Is like you can have a really great practice and a great life. That's what they want to buy. They don't want to buy an overworked, burned out, you know, shag carpet firm. They want to have a great life and they want to buy a great practice. That's what you have to build first to make it interesting for them to buy. So great question. Mike, what else you got? The next question is, when purchasing a firm, I assume you're buying all of their assets, including the A&R. Is this correct? This comes from Carl. It's a great question, Carl. It depends. Um, so we didn't, one of the things we do in the workshop is spend some time walking through the ethics of it. Um, and there's different ways of doing the deal. A lot of lawyers will merge firms to avoid the, um, there's a rule, in a, a rule basically requiring disclosure to your client that a third party buys a firm versus a merger than a sell. Um, so my experience will be that you'll per possibly buy the assets and the AR, depending what the value of the AR and what the AR might be, the contingency practice, it's in the, you know, it obviously makes sense. But if it's a family law practice, you've got to do a study of whether the AR is any good. So it may be that you not buy the AR, you buy the equipment and pay a percentage of the AR collected versus paying cash up front for the AR. So that would be my quick response. I think hopefully I'm addressing your question. It's okay. hard to do this via webinar because I sure. can't see, I can't clarify it. Uh, the next question, we've got a couple more after this. <clears throat> what is a reasonable okay. timeline for selling your practice? If you plan to retire in five years, should you start the process now? This comes from Nancy. Yes, Nancy, you should start it now. Uh, I think you need to start it now. If you're selling it to an associate, you need to back into it. So if you're going to exit in five years or transition in five years becomes the question. If you're exiting in five years, then you're probably going to sell majority shares in four years, which requires you to probably sell um, interest in the firm probably in the next year. So let you sell 10% this year, um, maybe 20, another 20% next year. Um, probably the 50% threshold gets broken in year four, and the remainder gets sell, sold when you exit in year five. So I would think through how do you stage equity over time because if you have an associate attorney you want to start handing control and management and leadership and rainmaking to them over the five years to see how they do i'd rather know at year three how they're doing rather than year five so i would probably say year three is my pivot point or year four may be my pivot point depending on how well my associate's doing on rainmaking managing project managing um, I'm going to assume my associate's a good lawyer, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But I would say that if you're making an exit in year five or a transition in year five, you probably are pulling the trigger on equity release or selling equity in the next 12 months, 24 months at the latest, just to stage it over that period of time. All right. We've had a couple of people uh, Very good. Uh, ask. Good question. If uh, we could repeat the practice softwares that you'd recommend today, uh, recall hearing you mentioned Rocket Matter and Practice Panther. What were some of the others you had mentioned? Clio and My Case, M Y C A S E. Great. They're probably they're probably the biggest competitors of each other. They're all good. I, I you know they're all good. And uh, when one has a very innovative approach, the other three steal it from the one within about 12 months. So they're all pretty much 80% the same in my eyes. But customer service and education of my team are probably the most important things I look at with my, my case management company. All right. And we have one more question. Are your seminars limited to just attorneys or would they uh, include non-lawyer executives? I think they may mean maybe some key um, assistants or team leaders. No, it's a great question. I typically recommend in our up, in all of our programs, we price very, very, we price the um, workshops all the same. But if you're bringing a team leader or non-lawyer executive, I would say they're more than welcome to come to the workshop. We see them all the time in our workshops, um, especially in our upper level programs like Dominate Your Market or Practice Growth Program. We see key assistants and team leaders all the time in those workshops. It's a brilliant move by you as a lawyer because they're the ones implementing, they're the ones managing, they're the ones running the show. So 
why not bring them and let them get educated, learn from other people? I think it's a brilliant move. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have them back. Well, and workshops and programs. I would just want to chime in there, see if it's a great uh, way to have some buy-in with your team when you're coming back from a workshop or a um, group program like the Practice Growth Program. Uh, with the rest of your team, that you've got somebody else uh, who understands the ideas that you put together at the workshop and has a buy-in to bring it home to the rest of the team and help implement it. Absolutely, Mike. I mean, I, I think you, if anyone knows it, you would know it because uh, you've been actively involved in our programs over the years before your new role, um, and you saw the participation level. So we actually, um, if you haven't, when you go to the if you want more information at this, about this, email us at grow at com. One of the things that we do once a year is we put together a summit. And at the summit, one of the things that we do is we do an award ceremony. We award, we do an award for the best team leader of the year. So don't underestimate the value of a great team leader, a non-lawyer that's in your team. They're, they're just so exquisitely important and so valuable to firms. I would be remiss in not saying, We'd love to have them in any programs or workshops we teach. All right, that um, was our good final Mike, question, Steve. Yeah. Fan fantastic. We're just a few minutes over. I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar. Um, I hope this was value to you. I hope that um, if you get the opportunity, we'd love to see you in an upcoming program. If you're not sure if a program's a fit for you, don't hesitate to go to atticusadvantage.com and check out doing a practice growth diagnostic. It's a great place to start in uh, working with our company, and it has a tremendous level of value by itself. So just go to Addicts to Manage and click the button that says practice growth, I'm sorry, practice growth diagnostic. And just click, you know, practice growth diagnostic and listen to the video and watch that and see if it's something that you want to invest in. It's very reasonable, it's probably less than your hourly rate. So good, with that, Mike, thank you. I appreciate your support. Um, for those of you that are still with us, thank you for uh, joining us today. And with that, thank you, everybody.